Good morning. Today on Spotlight, a look at how the performing arts are taking center stage in Detroit's development. We'll learn how two particular projects are designed to attract local residents, suburbanites, and newcomers from around the world to downtown to discover and enjoy the city's gems. Our guest, Vince Paul, president and artistic director of the Music Hall Center for the Performing Arts, and Alan Nachman, co-founder of Cabaret 313. It's Sunday, November the 5th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Vince Paul, welcome to Spotlight. You're doing okay? Oh, very good. You have been making a lot of news as of late. Uh, you unveiled a major plans, $122 million expansion of Music Hall. Uh, walk us through the process. When did this all start? Oh, it started a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but you kept it under wraps pretty good. We did, we did. Well, you know, it's really about the trustees of the music hall. Uh, of course, our uh, chairman, Alex Parrish, and I sure. were tied at the hip. Good. So uh, probably uh, we got serious about it uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing is, is we were really looking at the, the music industry in Detroit. And how can we continue um, having that prolific output of music? Because you're, you're seeing music education and, and also sort of our music infrastructure getting marginalized over time. Mm -hmm. And then there was also um, the parcel that was next to the music hall, directly adjacent to the music hall. Now, You'll know, there's, there's four sports teams and three stadiums and seven theaters. That's a packed area. You got the DAC across it, the That's street. right, you've got the Opera you've House, got the, and you've got Ford Field. All the venues there for right. sports. Right, did you know it's 40 million visitors a year? Mm -hmm. 40 million. Right. And so this parcel is probably the most visible parcel in the entire city or the entire state of Michigan, really, if you look at it that way. So we wanted to make sure we, we, we had something complementary to that theater district, that entertainment district. And uh, so last year, it was only last year, I guess maybe two years ago, that uh, our trustees decided, you know what, let's lock up that parking lot. And 15 of them came together and bought that parking lot, that parcel next to us. And that's when we really got serious about building the new building that we had been dreaming of for 10 years. And make sure that people understand the old building, that historic building that Matilda Dodge. The finest Dodge, example of Art Deco the, 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 the architecture go, in the state. Goes back to the vision of Matilda Dodge many years ago. That's going to remain. Oh, yes. This is going to add on to that with sort of a catwalk, I think, between the two? There are several bridges that connect it, both underground and above ground. Uh, you know, it's interesting, when we were with Historic, they were, you know, very emphatic about uh, the existing building, and we were too. But we were also like, have you noticed of those 40 million people, how many of them are really noticing this, this architectural masterpiece called the Music Hall? We think that the new building provides contrast and it will provide awareness for the existing music hall as much as the existing music hall will create awareness for the new building. And you'll have programming in both buildings? Yes. But the new building can the new give building, you the ability to do things that you can't do right now. Correct. That's right. It's the first concert hall. Everyone points at the concert hall. There are 12 different businesses going on in there, but there is a new concert hall, and that's a big deal because it's probably the first concert hall of its size built in 80 years. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that patterns um, and expectations of today's audiences, they're looking for something different than Grandpa's Theater. <laughs> we know because we run Grandpa's Theater. We're terrific at Broadway and ballet. But times change. Uh, but times the music change. industry has changed and the acoustics and everything else are different. Pretty much, pretty much. So the new uh, concert hall, for example, doesn't have fixed seating. Mm -hmm. And we know that, you know, in today's audience, especially the young folks, they want to have that open floor plan. But they also want that those special boxes or booths or cabanas where they can have table service. So in the new, uh, in the new concert hall, for example, you'll be able to buy a booth for, I don't know, $5,000 for a concert of Mumford & Sons, and it'll come with eight tickets and a server, and you can have food and beverage. 
not unlike what you see at some of the arenas. Mm -hmm. that, that's the expectation that today's audiences have. And we really, we can fake it in some of the old theaters, but we, we kind of have to start over architecturally from the beginning to really deliver that 21st century experience. Talk a little bit about the financing um, and does that involve the taxpayers? No. <laughs> right. I know that's very important. You, well, you know, that, that's the one thing they're saying. Are, are they tapping into my pocket? They are okay. I'm, I'm going to continue to listen. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's capital sources, uh, and we'll be doing an awful lot of fundraising, sure. uh, and bonds, and all. That. But the bonds are very important because um, I, I I've learned a lot of lessons from very smart people, and uh, my life changed a bit, I guess, when Alex Parrish, his old friend, Gabe Maritab, who does. Um, a lot of 501c3 tax-free bonds, and they use those bonds for um, low-income housing and hospitals, but there was really no reason we couldn't use them for a community center like this, this, this new building. In fact, the Detroit Opera House did these exact bonds in 1999 to finance the Opera House. Oh. And what it is, is the, the, it has to be a municipal entity. So very often Michigan Economic Development Corporation, they do this on a regular basis. Um, but the, the DEGC, or the EDC in this case, they hadn't done it since 1999. And so we kind of dusted off those books and they, they are able to issue the bonds, but music hall will be the obligator. So the city is not on the hook with taxes or their credit rating or their anything. It's purely a pass-through administrative procedure. We take on those bonds and the debt of those bonds. Okay, we need to take a quick little break. We'll come back and do a quick little final segment with you. Uh, and we want to talk about the timeline, the timetable. When will this all get together? What did you envision? And when do people actually walk through the doors? We'll talk about that right after this. Welcome back to Spotlight, talking to Vince Paul, the president and artistic director for the Music Hall of Performing Arts. Um, architecturally, talk about this building. Um, who's the architect? Uh, what kind of experience do they have? Here's a little known fact. You know, Det um, Detroit is the only recognized UNESCO city of design in the United States. And a lot of it has to do with our architecture and you see all the canons of architects. So we knew that it had to be a spectacular 21st century architect to join the C. Howard Cranes and the Yamasakis and the Saarinens, and the, you know? And so uh, when we came upon Todd Williams, one of the preeminent architects working today in the world, he's currently doing the Obama Presidential Library in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he had just finished Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center in New York. New York. That was a big deal. That was an 800 million. And he's from reason. Detroit, was he? He's from Detroit, right. so, but he had never designed anything in Detroit. Wow. So we approached him like, it's time, and he said, it's time. I was, said, I was, like, was he excited to oh, he that is, I can do something in my original hometown? I think he like pushed all his projects aside and was really concentrating on this, this Detroit uh, transformational music center, and uh, he has put more time into it than maybe any of his other projects. Because <laughs> it's, you, you know, it's your hometown. Right, and you want to make a, make a statement. Uh, what's the timeline? When can people expect to see this to fruition? Right, in the fall of 2026, uh -huh. we will open. Uh, we will certainly um, be working over the next three years because the I like to say the building is you, Detroit. What we're doing is, is we're creating a bricks and mortar facility, if you will, but it's really about community engagement. How can we promote your cultural institution? How can we promote the thing that you do? Let this building be a, a, a downtown central hub for all of the music industry elements that are going on, but, but they're very fragmented all over Southeast Michigan. You know that there are 350 music businesses representing two and a half billion dollars in economic activity, but you don't know where they are. So if I hear you right, Vince Paul, you're saying, and, and to date, since you've been in town, which has been a good little while now, and at the helm of the music hall, you've been very 
good and very inclusive about bringing the community in and asking the community, what do you want That's in right. this particular venue? Not just what is it I from the top down want, but what do you as a community want? This is going to continue, but it now continues with a different type of building that has a lot more variety in it in terms of space and things you can do with it. People say all the time, you know, musical, you do a mishmash of programming there. And we're like, by design, because we're trying to engage all sort of 25 micro communities that live here. And it's a pretty strong proof of concept. We went from a $3 million annual budget to a $12 million annual budget over the course of those years because we were engaging everybody. We weren't working towards just single silos. We were engaging everybody. And year after year, it just built and built. So now where do we go, right? The Music Hall does 400 events a year across four different venues. So this new building, we're taking those same values of multicultural programming and engagement and we're moving them into a, a bigger facility or we're adding on top of that because we proved it works if everybody gets together and you create common platform there's nothing Detroit can't do when you sit with the um, uh, the movers and shakers of your trustees and the board and you meet with all these other people you know visit Detroit and uh, convention and visitor bureau people sure um, what is it you envision that this building does for becoming an attraction to downtown so that people not just from the west side of the state and other the, the UP but across America will say I got to get to Detroit because I've heard about that along with this Motown expansion and all the other things that are going on that are creating the excitement for this city now. Right, because it engages locally, obviously. Um, but we think, okay, we have, Visit Detroit will tell you we have 20 million business visitors. But you know, they tend to come in, have their meeting and sit in their hotel room. They don't know how to engage in the city. So we're creating a portal, a welcome center with an all venue ticketing kiosk or box office where you can engage and say, it's your first stop in figuring out Oh, I had no idea we had all of these attractions here in Detroit. It's wayfinding. So if we like that $20 million, uh, 20 million uh, person number, what happens if it becomes 50 million people, 80 million people? You know, I like to say that I'll take you to Berlin and there's somebody listening to Masharia Moore. You know there is. <laughs> but more than that, if we were to go to their house or apartment, you'll find three products that were designed and manufactured in Detroit. You can call it what you will, but that's cultural influence. And I think people have this curiosity about Detroit. And so really, it was, it's incumbent upon us to remove obstacles for them to come to Detroit, because I don't know where to go. And we're going to show you where to go and how to engage in the city. Vince Parr, I know you're on a tight schedule. Will you keep us up to date on the uh, various press conferences and stuff that you have coming up because this is a process. It is. Uh, this is getting you out the starting gate and uh, we just got to get to the finish line but there's going to be some ebbs and flows in the process. We'll have well. workshops over the construction period of how people can engage, how cultural organizations can engage in the new building. It's you Detroit. That's what this building is. All right, Vince Paul, good seeing you as always and best of luck and uh, this sounds very exciting. And when Spotlight returns, I'll sit down with Alan Nachman, co-founder of Cabaret 313. What is it? You're about to find out. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Spotlight. Alan Nachman, you're doing okay? Doing fine, thank you. It's good having you on our program. Okay, you're very involved. You're co-founder of Cabaret 313. What is that? Cabaret 313 is a, uh, is a genre, it's an art genre of performance. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it started, and it's a nonprofit, by the way. We like to call it the best kept secret in Detroit, okay. because our budget for marketing is not big enough to cover the whole city. <laughs> but uh, we bring in Broadway stars, uh, recognized Broadway stars from New York mm -hmm. into Detroit for a weekend, and they put on a couple performances 
Uh, performances are sort of intimate. We have 80, 90, 100 people, no more than that, all sitting at uh, cabaret tables. We don't have an audience uh, in regular seating like an auditorium. Like a theater type of thing. Yeah, and uh, they, they put on two performances, each about an hour each. And um, the interesting thing is they sing a lot of songs, the American Songbook, they sing Broadway. But the key that makes a cabaret different than a performance is the patter. The patter is what they talk about in between the songs, why they became a singer, why they chose this song, what the song means to them. So they weave a story into their performance of song. So it's story and it's music yeah. uh, with Broadway talent. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Detroit hasn't always had this, um, but you've had this a good decade or so now, and you've gotten past, I guess, that rough period so that you can clearly say this is a success. Yeah, we, we started 11 years ago. This is our 11th year. And we weren't sure whether it would take, it would take so to speak, in Detroit. So we started uh, first in neighborhood homes having performances before we started going into the, the major venues that we use in downtown Detroit. And after three, one in Birmingham, one in Midtown, and one in Gross Point, after three different performances over a period of a number of months, we saw that people liked this. People loved this thing. And rather than flying to New York and seeing a cabaret show in New York, you can drive right down to Detroit and see a show. So, Alan, was it your sense that the timing was right for Detroit? And I think I read that you also felt this would help in terms of the revitalization of Detroit. Exactly right. We, Sandy Reitelman, who's the co-founder, and myself came up with a concept of bringing cabaret to Detroit. But the timing was important. And 10, 11 years ago, uh, some of the projects that are now come into fruition mm -hmm. were just getting built, were just getting dreamed about. And they, they sort of, we sort of said the phoenix is rising from the ashes, so to speak. And we wanted to be part of that scene. And a lot of the people that come to Cabaret are uh, from the suburbs. They don't know about downtown Detroit. It is a way of introducing And we were, we were trying to reintroduce downtown Detroit to a lot of people that just don't go there. Mr. Nachman, hold on just a second. I'm going to rush to a little break here, and we'll come back with more questions right after this. Perform. We uh, we made a uh, one of our board members, Erwin Elson, suggested, and we, it's worked out fine, that we do different uh, venues rather than just one venue. Mm -hmm. So we started. We went to meet David D. Chiera at the Detroit Opera. Told him what we had in mind. He says, "Great, love it idea. Use our black box theater." So we have the black box theater. We uh, th started using the Cube at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. We started using the Rivera Court at the DIA, and uh, we've used the YMCA over on Broadway. We use the Garden Theater on Woodward. So we're always moving around to different venues. It gives people from the burbs a chance to see other parts of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And then now you've got something called Detroit Public Theater. That's yeah, and, sort and of brand new. Company. Detroit Public Theater has been around for three or four years. It's a nonprofit theater well recognized, they were using a, uh, a room at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra for their theater presentations. They just opened a new theater. It's an old building that they rehabbed on, I think it's on 2nd or 3rd Avenue uh, in Detroit. And we're having our last show of this season at the Detroit Public Theater. Very good. Um, it sounds like a lot of fun and it sounds like you're really enjoying yourself. You have an educational component to this. We do. With Wayne State. Thank you for mentioning that. We have master classes and what we do is we negotiate with our performers that after a Saturday night performance they'll stay Sunday and teach a master class to students. So we have master classes. We've had them at Wayne State University, uh, the Mosaic Youth Theater in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a lot of master classes on Sunday at noon where our performer will stay overnight and then teach these teenagers about musical theater and give them 
uh, constructive criticism, so to speak. Sure. And uh, we've had uh, brought our performers up to the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. They have a musical theater department, and we've uh, had uh, our, one of our performers teach a master class there. And uh, at Oakland University, also, they have a musical theater program. You really so spread we, that around. And 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 we we do not charge for this. We we pay ourselves out of our budget, and we just offer this to the students. Sure. Uh, if people want to get more information in terms of like to schedule what's coming up, do you have a pretty big lineup for it? We have we, we have a great lineup, and uh, I'll, I'll mention if I can do it. Our yeah. our uh, website is cabaret313.org, O-R-G, because we're a nonprofit, and uh, all our whole season is there. And we have a a very exciting season of uh, Broadway stars coming in. Final question. How did you get involved in this? Because I was looking at your background. Uh, you have a legal background. Right, right. Uh, you've right. done a lot of fundraising and other things, but I didn't necessarily see the theater in there. Well, uh, my wife and I have been married a number of years, and we go three, four, five times a year to New York City, and we see Broadway plays. And probably 12, 15 years ago, we started noticing that not only are there Broadway plays in New York, but they're cabaret venues where this, the uh, performers from the Broadway shows will perform a cabaret show. So we started going to the cabaret shows and we started seeing a couple people at every show, the same people. So we introduced ourselves, found out about cabaret a little bit more and uh, they encouraged us. They said, if you think it's a good idea, maybe you want to try in Detroit. And a couple years later we said, yeah, we're going to try in Detroit. So that's how it's, it's really started. And the rest is history. The rest is like history. Yes, yeah. Alan Nachman, it's been great talking with you. Best of luck as you continue to do all of this. Uh, we'll put information up on the screen so people can get in touch with you and uh, just avail themselves of all this talent that one we have in Detroit, but also transporting some of it to Detroit right, as right. well. Yeah. Thank you. All right, it's our pleasure. Thanks. And I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.